Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 92. No one can stop you from doing exactly what you want to do if you can accept that the cavalry won't come. And if you can be the cavalry, it gives you the chance to be happy. Mark Duplass. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Masterclass, and specifically Werner Herzog's Masterclass. I am super, super, super excited about this course uh, that's going to be coming out real soon. But if you enroll now early, you'll get early access to his course. If you guys don't know who Werner Herzog is, he's an Academy Award winning director. If you've heard his voice, you'll know who he is. He directed Grizzly Man, among other great documentaries and feature films. He's got a total of 70 feature films, plus over 50 awards. It's remarkable. So he decided to team up with Masterclass to create an amazing online resource for filmmakers as he teaches you, as he says, the essentials of filmmaking that you can learn within two weeks and you definitely don't have to go to film school. This is over five hours of video. You get a workbook that you could download as well as access to Werner as well. So the course is coming out very, very soon, but if you sign up now, you'll get early access. So all you have to do is head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash masterclass to download this amazing course which i've already signed up for because i want to say i want to take it the show is also sponsored by freefilmbook.com that's freefilmbook.com where you can go and download your free filmmaking audiobook from audible you get a one book for free download definitely check it out there are and if it's not a film book there's thousands upon th- tens of thousands of other books you can download so head over to freefilmbook.com and check that out so guys, today, I know the title of the show is crazy, is, you know, you become a better filmmaker when you have no money? Well, you know what? I'm going to have to say, yeah, you do. You become a better filmmaker when you have fewer resources. Uh, Robert Rodriguez said that back in the day. He said that uh, when you start doing studio movies or have bigger budgets, you just, anytime there's a problem, you just throw a, a hose on it and it's called the money hose. And that takes care of the problems when you can... You lose your your ability to be creative and on the spot to kind of solve those problems. But I wanted to bring this up because a lot of people have a lot of preconceived notions about filmmaking and what it what you absolutely need to make a movie and what you absolutely need to to tell a story. And uh, I I really kind of took this as Meg on uh, as a experiment as well as my first feature film. I wanted to see what was the least I needed to make a movie. Like literally what is what is the stripped down version of what it takes to make a movie? So that's what I did with This Is Meg. So when Jilly and I were coming up with the whole concept for This Is Meg and, and getting it going and writing the script, you know, Jilly was writing around locations that we had. And I told her like, you could shoot here, we could shoot there. Anything that we had control over. And it it worked out wonderfully, you know. Um, just on on a side note, guys, I'll give you guys an update on what's going on with this is Meg. Uh, right now, I am in edit. Uh, I will hopefully have a a locked uh, a a rough cut by the end of this week, a full rough cut, and a lock cut by the end of next week. And uh, I move very quick. <laughs> I've moved. I've been editing like a beast. That's why I've been a little bit uh, loose. Last week, I only released one. Uh, podcast, which is the filmmaking hacks, a uh, film festival hacks uh, podcast episode. So I just been I've been busy in the lab, guys. So uh, please forgive me for not coming up, but I'm back with full force now uh, with uh, two episodes this week and moving on forward with uh, two episodes a week as usual. But uh, you know, I I'm I'm learning so much and I've learned so much. You know, you think that uh, just because you know a lot of a lot of the tribes like, well, you know, Alex has been in business for twenty some years. You know, like, yeah, but even at 20 some years, you learn something new every day. And this is a brand new ex- experience for me to shoot the way I've shot. You know, I've shot on very big budget uh, commercials and music videos where I had huge techno cranes and helicopters and, and um, you know, 50 people on the crew and so on. And this is the, I really did not have that on This Is Meg at, at all. I stripped it down and 
I know a lot of people were asking me, uh, what are you shooting on? What are you shooting on? What's the gear you're using? And I decided to use the Blackmagic Cinema Camera 2.5K, not even the 4K version. Now, the reason I decided to use the 2.5K as opposed to 4K uh, in resolution was because I'm the DIT on this entire <laughs> movie as well. And I didn't have the hard drive space and just all all a bunch of different things that would would have caused make it a little bit more headache. I would have to have purchased more um, more cards for you know on set because it would have dropped everything in half as far as and so instead of 40, uh, 45 minutes per card, I would only get twenty some minutes per card and so on. And it just didn't make sense for this kind of movie for this situation. The next movie I do, I'll probably shoot four K. I probably won't shoot higher than four K. Uh, depending on what camera I use, either the Blackmagic 4K cinema camera or the Ursa Mini um, or something along those lines, but without getting too geeky. Um, but the reason I'm bringing this up is because a lot of people get so caught up with, oh, but I don't have this gear, I don't have that gear. I'm like, I just grabbed the camera I had. I owned that camera. And then I was uh, I was lucky enough to get uh, a borrow, a second camera. So we had a two-camera shoot um, from my, uh, my main man, and gaffer slash second camera, uh, Austin, who was in, uh, who was my right hand man on this entire shoot, which I'm very grateful for. And I'll talk a little bit about the crew in a minute uh, of how we were able to do this. But very, very important thing. I had a friend of mine um, who was on set, not on set, but I think they'd heard about it, and um, they were going, "Hey, man, what are they shooting their movie on?" And this was a DP, and uh, this is another DP who I I barely knew. And they said, oh, what are they shooting on? They're like, oh, they're shooting on the Black Magic. And they're like, oh, what a piece of crap camera that is. And then I just sat there for a second and thought about it. Because I've, I'm, I've been a colorist for 10 years. I've done tests on my camera. And I know the image quality I can get out of this camera. But their, but their bias and their attitude was remarkable to me. So while... They're still talking about like which is the highest resolution, which is the best image quality, which is the best camera, and blah 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 blah. I've already edited my movie, and I'm moving on to my second movie. You know, I hope that makes sense to you guys. Not to get caught up in that crap, and just because someone else is like, oh, that's a horrible camera, I'm like, well, well, screw you then, dude. You know, screw you. I, you know, while you're still talking about that, I got a feature made. You know, because I didn't let that stop me, and that's the thing I've I've been saying for weeks now, if not months is stop throwing obstacles in front of yourself. You got to get a good camera. You got to get a good image quality. Is the the movie that is the camera that I chose the best image quality in the world? No. Is it 85% of the best image quality I can get for the be, for best bang for the buck? Absolutely. It's going to look fantastic. It's going to look better than a DSLR camera and so on. And I just wanted to impress upon you guys what what people get caught up in. This kind of BS is bullshit about what people, oh, I need this or I need that. You got to strip down what you, what do you need? Let's, let's strip down what you exactly need to make a movie. You need a camera. You need lenses. You need some lights. You need controllable environments. You need a good audio. You need actors. And the most important thing is you need a story. You know, what else? What else is there? Now, mind you, there's, I, I know there's a ton of other things. Oh, you need costumes. You need, you need this. You need that. You need art direction. You need this. Look, the way we worked with this is whenever we got to a location, I looked around. And I said, okay, that's because everything was lived in. So when you see my edit suite in the movie, I just tweaked a couple things. I took a, I took a Yoda and a Morpheus out of the way because I didn't want to deal with any, any copyright or you know uh, trademark issues. And everything else was left. I left the pens the way they were. I left the post-its scattered because that's my desk. And it's natural and it's supposed to look that way. And in this kind of movie, and I can't stress it enough, in this kind of more realistic indie film, it makes sense. If I was doing a superhero movie uh, that's $200 million, it's a completely different mindset, guys. But for this kind of movie, you just do what you do. And you just use what you've got. And that's that's my point. You know, with this kind of movie, you have to think about story. And the, the most important thing is story and performance. And that's what this this process worked for did for me. Is I was able to focus on performance and story and the story that I'm trying to tell and the performances that I'm trying to get out of my actors. And all the technical stuff, I just got the basics down. 
what are the basics do I need? I need good audio, I need a good image, and I need controllable environments. Well, I've got all that. And then everything else kind of worked its way out, worked its way through. And I'm saying this because I don't want you guys to get stuck on not being able to move forward because I don't have this or I don't have that. Now, the title of this podcast is, you know, you become a better filmmaker when you have no budget. Well, you do because you're focusing on what really matters. You're focusing on the story. You're focusing on the actors where you or you should be. Now, again, it depends on the kind of story you're trying to tell. If you're trying to tell a horror story or, you know, you're making a horror movie and you have blood and guts and, you know, monsters and all this kind of stuff. Well, those are things you need to have in order to tell your story properly. We were trying to tell a dramedy. So we needed a story. We needed actors. We needed a controllable environment and all the other stuff that I was telling you. And that's it to tell the story we're trying to tell. So whatever that story might be, if you're trying to tell an action movie, there's going to be other other things that you're going to have to go through to get that told. Because believe me, I've done action movies and I know you need prop guns. You need, if you're going to do stunts, you got to figure out how you're going to do stunts safely. If not, hire a stunt person and be a you know, stunt coordinator and stunt people to do it properly, depending on the kind of VFX you might need. And then all everything starts getting more and more complicated. And for my first feature, I didn't want to get that complicated. I wanted to get it right down to the the core, the stripped down naked filmmaker, Na- just being completely naked, just story, a good camera, some good audio, some good actors, some nice environments, and let's make a movie. It's exactly what we did. We shot the movie in around eight days, believe it or not. And I've been editing, I've edited this movie probably about two weeks because we shot what we needed. And because I'm an editor, I shot what I needed to get done. Now, don't think this was all a walk in the park. There were problems along the way, as there always is in production. You figure things out as you go along. You're like, oh, that didn't work out. Oh, what could I have done better here? Oh, that's a, there were technical issues that we we had to work around and, you know, and, and things that we figured out along the way. And honestly, the other big thing I, I can I can suggest to you guys is in in the in the tradition of of Chris Nolan, um, don't shoot your first movie all in a row. <laughs> Sometimes I, this is the first time in my entire career I have not shot in a row. Uh, we shot this over six weeks, but you know, two days here, one day there, you know, all that kind of stuff based around the actor schedule that we had, and it was so wonderful to shoot that way because I could just shoot. Look at, bring it back, look at the footage, check things, see how things were going. Oh, I, I want to tweak this, boom. And then you have time to think about other avenues of the story. And we made some big story changes as we were going through this, Jillian and I. Like, oh, why don't we have this character do this at the end? Because now that makes just so much more sense. But if we would have been shooting in a row and scheduled all of it out, it wouldn't have been able to be done. But because we had that kind of freedom, that kind of free-flowing freedom to do things... It made the movie better. Again, it's this kind of story, this kind of budget, this kind of this kind of um, film that I'm talking about. Again, this doesn't work on bigger movies, more complex stories, more complex productions with action and horror and other things like that. You know, or you know, big locales, or you've got helicopter or drone shots, and you know, all these kind of different things. This kind of movie, it works perfectly. It's a comedy drama, and it's a dra- it's a dramedy, and it worked perfectly for the kind of movie where we were attempting to make. So you know another another big story. Uh, you know a lot of a lot of things. Uh, uh, I had a few of the tribe members contact me and ask me about because they heard I was they saw behind the scenes footage of the Black Magic camera I was using. They're like, "Hey, what do you, how are you dealing with the crop factor?" And for those who don't understand what the crop factor is, when you have a thirty five millimeter lens. And you put it on a camera that's not a full frame, super 35 frame, meaning that the chip is not the full size that it should be, um, you get a crop factor. So it means that if you have a 14 in, a 14 millimeter lens, it really turns into more like a 24 to 30 millimeter lens. So you lose a lot of what the lens has to offer. So the Blackmagic Cinema camera at the 2.5K has a crop factor and there is a and it happens with many cameras uh dslrs and so on until you start getting into the higher end cameras which were all super 35 or higher um and i just i just told them i'm like look 
I don't know what it's supposed to look like. I just grab the camera, put the lens on, and what I get on that lens, I get. And let's move on and not bitch about what I don't have and just enjoy what I do have. And that's something that I think is a great motto for filmmaking. Stop complaining about things you don't have. Oh, I don't have this. I don't have enough money. I don't have the right stars. I don't have the... Just do what with, with what you have. Don't complain about what you don't have. And you'll get farther, so much farther, so much faster. Look, guys, if you made... If you I've, and I know a lot of filmmakers out there, but look, let's say I repeat this process five times in the next two years, which is my goal. <laughs> we'll see what happens. But I'm going to try to repeat this process a handful of times, each time getting a little bit more ambitious, a little bit bigger. So while I'm I'm not waiting around for people, I'm not waiting around for the right camera. By the way, and by the way, just so everybody knows, I had access to full red packages, full area Alexa packages uh, offered to me for free that I could have had this entire shoot, but I decided not. I didn't want to deal with it because when you bring those guys on, these those kind of cameras are pigs. They're big. They're bulky. I wouldn't have been able to do the majority of the stuff that I did because of their size, weight, and infrastructure that is needed to make them work properly. Don't get me wrong. They're much better cameras than the camera I had, but they didn't fit the storytelling process that I had and the crew that I had. By the way, I'll, I'll tell you about the crew. I had... One camera guy slash gaffer who had some lights. I had some lights. Um, When I say lights, not a lot of lights. We're talking about LED lights, Um, you know, 1K tops um, on anything. I had some 500s and a little and a couple of little, you know, $25 LED newer lights that kind of, you know, bounce things off. And uh, so I had Austin, who was uh, just amazing on this project. Um, who's my second camera and gaff. Um, when I say gaff, he plugged stuff in, uh, <laughs> not to take away from that, but he moved lights and he plugged stuff in, which were awesome. But he also ran camera for me. Um, and is an ex- very experienced, uh, cinematographer. We had one guy running audio, our boom guy, which was, uh, we had three guys on the entire show on and off. Um, but, uh, all they did was hold the boom and run the task cam which was my equipment. So they basically just came, held a boom, hit record, and, and, and rode the levels a little bit on that little task cam. No mixer. Okay? And uh, what else? Who else did we have? We had Jilly, who was our actress, slash producer, slash craft service, slash slate. Uh, I'm going to do an entire montage of her running, doing our slates, because it's hilarious. Uh, it was on an iPad. Uh, and I will talk all about that process later. We had, um, let me see, who else did we have? On occasion, we might have had one extra hand, you know, just kind of like running around moving things, I think on one day or two of those eight days. And that's it, guys. That's it. That was my entire crew making um, This Is Meg. The actors did their own makeup. They came to set with us like three or four different sets of their own clothes to... uh, for me to choose from to see what's going to work for the movie. And that was it, guys. Everyone really just gathered together and we made a movie. And it was wonderful. We could move quickly. It was, you know, it was just it was just great. We had a wonderful time. Everybody was fed, well fed the entire time. We didn't have spinning wheels of death. By the way, uh, an industry term, spinning wheels of death means pizza. Don't ever bring pizza out for 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 on set. Maybe once on a shoot, maybe, if you get into trouble, but don't do it. It slows people down, it gets them all heavy and lethargic and don't and they don't get they don't work as well. And it's just cheap. It's just like, oh God. Everyone had good meals, very affordable for the production, and very tasty for, for the crew. Everybody was there, loved being there, was happy to be there, worked their eight to ten hour days, very relaxed. I don't think we worked past I think one day we worked 12 hours because it was the longest day of the shoot because we had a day and a night shoot. And that was it, guys. You don't need a lot of money to make a movie. Now, mind you, don't forget, I have 20 years of experience. I have a a full post facility, meaning that I have my Mac and color grading system and things like that that I've built up over the years. But that's something that I've built up over the years. 
And if you were going to try to, and also, I also learned how to do it over the last 10 years. So I'm holding a lot of hats in this movie. I'm actually going to have to change my name. You'll have to look for some of my aliases in the credits because it's going to be ridiculous how many times my name and Julie's name will show up in this credit, in the critics, in the, in the credits. Um, so, but, but that's what I've been able to do with my resources. These are my resources. These are my connections, my people that I've been able to build up relationships with over the years. So you need to do the same for your movie, for what you're trying to do. You know, you have to pull the relationships that you have and use the resources that you have. If someone would have told me that they're going to make a movie with a, in a Mexican town action movie where there's going to be explosion, a car chase with a, with a, a, a school bus, and uh, all sorts of craziness, blood squirts, I mean, uh, blood hits, uh, all done with no visual effects, I would go, you're nuts. You're absolutely nuts. You'll never be able to do this. Where are you going to get all this stuff? But that is exactly what a mariachi was. That's what Robert Rodriguez did. Why? Because that's what Robert Rodriguez had access to. That was his list of stuff that he could use. And I know out there, you I know you guys out there have resources that you might not even think you have, but you just have to check and see who you who will help you. And one thing I did learn on this process, guys, when you say you're going to go make a movie, you'll be amazed at how many people come out to want to be a part of it and want to help. You've no idea. You've just, it's, it was really interesting. I actually turned people away that wanted to help on the movie because I, it, was, it was remarkable. I could not believe how many people wanted to jump on. You have the same capability of doing what Robert did, what I did, what Kevin Smith did with Clerks. He had a video store and he had a convenience store and he's like, I'm going to go make a movie. And that's what he did. He, and that's what he had access to and he made a movie called Clerks. And that's, that's, that was his list of stuff. So you've got to come up with the list that you have to go make your movie. Also, I have a quick tip for all the film students out there who are actually going to a film school who are going to a local community college or a big, big university or, or uh, any of the big film schools out there. If I were you, this is what I would do. I would be borrowing all the equipment I could get for free from the school every weekend. And I would make a feature film over the course of a year and you write it out and don't tell anybody you're making a feature. Just tell people you're making scenes for something. Because the second you tell them it's a feature, school's going to hear about it and they're going to say, no, 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 we can't let you do that. But you're like, no, no, every weekend I'm just going out there and testing scenes and so on and so forth. And then you just let your inner circle of the actors and things like that know that you're making a feature, a feature film. But that's what you should do. And you'd be foolish if you don't because I'll probably be the most you'll get out of that film school experience. And you should, because you're paying for it, have access to all of their equipment. Okay? So go out and write a script around locations and things that you have and then rent out and get out there, take out uh, or borrow all the equipment you can from the school you're going to. And don't get caught up in the crap of, I don't have this or I don't have that. That's what's going to, that's when, that, that, if you keep doing that, guys, you're going to wake up tomorrow and you're going to be 60 fucking five and you're not going to be, you would have said, man, I wish I would have done this or I wish I would have done that. You can't let that time go by, guys. It took me 20 years plus years to be right where I am right now, talking to you guys with a feature film that, to be honest with you, I'm very proud of. <laughs> It's extremely funny and extremely touching, in my opinion. <laughs> but I'm proud of it, and, I, and it's in my hard drives as we speak right now. And it's taken me 20-odd years to get here. And I don't want that for you guys. I want you guys to be able to do it quicker than I did. That's why I do Indie Film Hustle, to help you guys get there. So you will become a better filmmaker when you have no budget. And I think... I really, really think at the beginning of your careers or at the first time you're going to try to make a feature film, you should do, like Mark Duplass says, make a $1,000 feature film. Make a $2,000 feature film. And, and then grow from there. And then the next movie you make, you make another $2,000 movie, another $5,000 feature. And then you go from there. 
because you're going to learn so much from each time you make it. By the time you get to your third, fourth, fifth, or sixth feature, you're going to be a pro. And then that's when the money comes in because I guarantee you when you start producing movies that actually make money, and we can talk about how we're going to make money later, but let's just get it in the can first, guys. Let's get a movie made. Then we're going to worry about how we're going to market it and sell it because you guys are going to go on the same adventure I am on how to sell this movie when it's all said and done. But this is about making the movie, not marketing the movie. So I'm going to leave a link in the description. Uh, By the way, the show notes are at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 092. Now, I'm going to leave uh, in the show notes, I'm going to leave a link to Mark Duplass's, uh, the writer-director Mark Duplass's uh, South by Southwest keynote speech about how he made his movie, his first feature for $1,000 and his entire philosophy. It's like the Bible of how to make really small indie films to start. And he is huge now making millions of dollars a year, doing whatever the hell he wants to do, whenever the hell he wants to do it, and making a wonderful living and just playing with his friends and having a good time. But it all started with one little movie called Puffy Chair. And I'm going to leave links to to the trailer for Puffy Chair and all that stuff, but I want you guys to listen to it. It's about an hour long. You've got to listen to this keynote. It will change your life. You have to listen to it. IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 092. So I hope this episode helped you guys out a bit. I will continue to give you updates on Indie, on um, on This Is Meg. Uh, of course, if you want to just follow us, uh, head over to thisismeg.com or at facebook.com forward slash thisismegfilm if you want to like our page and, and keep updated on what we're doing on This Is Meg. And if you do, if you do sign up for our Facebook page, you're going to start seeing some of my advertising techniques that I'm going to be using to get the word out on This Is Meg. So just for morbid curiosity, if you guys want to see how I'm going to market this this little puppy, it might be a good idea to check that out. Now, I also want to talk about uh, Indie Film Syndicate and the membership site that is growing very fast. And to all my Indie Film Syndicate members, thank you so much for signing on. Um, and I know a lot of people have been getting a great amount of value from all the courses and things we're doing and been very patient with my micro budget uh, master class, which is all about This Is Meg, because I've been busy doing uh, the editing on This Is Meg. So we are going to be coming up with a bunch of tutorials, because like I said, what I just talked about in this episode was just a scratch on the surface of what I learned over the course of the last couple months. And uh, I, I really want to really break it down for you guys and, and explain to you what and how I did every step of the way the problems we faced, the things I did wrong, the things I did right, uh, and all the things that uh, went went along with this crazy ride up up until the point where I'm at right now, which is post. So, uh, oh, by the way, I'm also editing this whole movie on DaVinci Resolve. And I know a lot of you guys out there um, use DaVinci Resolve because it's a free editing system that you can download from blackmagicdesign.com. If you guys don't have this program, download it, guys. You can color there. But also you can edit, and the new editing system there is pretty remarkable. I've edited this entire feature film uh, on it, and it's been wonderful. It's been really, really wonderful so far. I'm going to go into deep detail about how I edited, what my workflow was, and so on in the in the syndicate. So that's at IndieFilmSyndicate.com, and check that out, guys. So before I go, guys, I'm just going to give you this parting word of advice. Don't let anything stop you from making your feature film. Make a list of what you have around you. Write around that. I will go into detail in the syndicate on how we were able to write the entire movie in less than three weeks with with this very structured story but had a high improv, improv element to it. But extremely structured and a lot of scenes were written out in full and being able to put it all together. But you got to write that list out, guys. What do you have? The house you live in, the car you own, your friend's house. Does one of your friends work somewhere where you can shoot at night? Uh, anything you can do, just look around you and what you have access to. What friends of yours has a camera? Where? Why don't you buy your, you know, what do you need to buy your own camera? Buy yourself a Blackmagic pocket camera. And by the way, Blackmagic pays me no money. Uh, they're not a sponsor at all. I just really like their products. And... 
I like any company that gives the power to the people. That's why I was a big, uh, big supporter of uh, Final Cut Pro when it first came out. Not so much now, but when it first came out, it, it it completely revolutionized the business because before then, Avid cost a thousand thousands of dollars, and you could do the same thing on a Final Cut Pro. Um, so, what do you have access to? Just make that list up, guys. And it's I'm telling you, and you write around that list, you'll get your first movie done by the end of the year. And I want you guys to reach out to me and tell me, Alex, I'm just starting my movie. I'm going to start crowdfunding it. I'm going to make my movie, make it for a thousand bucks, make it two thousand, make a five thousand dollar movie, and go. And let me know how it goes, guys. Please email me, message me, and let me know what the process is for you guys, how it's going along. And uh, I'll give you any tips and helps I can give you along the way without question, because I'm here for you guys. I really want you guys to succeed. And it's my goal in life to help as many indie filmmakers and artists out there uh, make their art. Because like I've said before, it's your responsibility to get your art out into the world because you have no idea how it will change somebody else's life. So keep that hustle going, keep that dream alive, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.